Okay, look, people came. I'm shocked and surprised and pleased and life is good. Um, everyone, of course, checked the website. Our class is canceled, but no, sadly, no. Um, so at this stage, remember I promised you that there was going to be math, 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 and now you found out, yeah, there was math and there was quite a lot of it. Um, at this stage, my guess is most people are at the lowest ebb of the semester in terms of what the hell is going on. Um, the usual thing is it comes at you, it comes at you fast, there's loads of it, and you're like, oh, I have no clue what is going on there. I've got no idea what's going on there. I have no idea what that, that's about. Um, if you're feeling that way, that is normal. That is the stage of the semester we are at in terms of the math and the Fisher-Gray model. So don't panic. The thought is and the hope is and the intention is from this point on, it will get better. It'll start to make more sense. But if it doesn't make any sense at all to you now, that's normal. Right? Hopefully you've been paying attention the best you can, but I know it's hard to follow when you're new to it all. And with math, generally speaking, it never takes until you sit down with pencil and paper and do it yourself. There is just no substitute for your own self doing the thing. And you haven't had an opportunity to do that yet. Right? So I'm going to put some homeworks up, one for the, the forthcoming, um, one for the coming tutorials, but other ones just so that you give, get a chance to try this stuff. Now, in terms of doing the math, you do not have to do the math for the, for the exam because it, it takes a few iterations before it starts being natural in any way. You have everything you need in order to solve a question on an exam. If I did, gave you a math question on the exam, but you haven't had a chance to practice it, so it doesn't count. It doesn't count until you get a chance to practice it. So over the coming weeks, we're going to start having that. And as you do it yourself, it's going to make a lot more sense. Honestly, why? Well, promising is, is bad, but I really honestly think so. But if you're the sort of person like me who's going to put everything off to the last minute and just before the final you're going to try to do the math, you will be screwed because it takes a while to sit in, sink in. It takes a few iterations of trying to do it. Doesn't mean you've got to invest thousands of hours, but you've got to do them in a timely manner so you have time to, first of all, get stuck and get help, and also just to have it sink in. So this, you know, I'll be, I'll be giving you stuff, and you'll have to do some for the tutorials, but you should do a few of them until it becomes second nature and easy. At the moment, you have two of them. Um, and again, I don't expect you to do it before the exam, because you know, exams are exams. But you have two of them in the old questions that I put up that you can try and have the answer key there in front of you. I recommend very strongly when you do that, which will be you know, during your break and, and after, when you do that, you try very hard not to look at the answer key. You get good and honestly stuck and be banging your head against the wall for 15 minutes and not know what to do. Because if you get stuck, if you struggle with it, if you're super frustrated, and then you look at the answer, that'll stay with you forever. But if you just say, I don't know, and look, then gone, right? It, it doesn't. So the, the getting stuck is part of the deal. And I'm sorry about that. It's a terrible deal, but we, you know, we don't make the rules. That's just how math is. Uh, you, you get stuck, you bang your head against the wall, then when you see it, it sticks with you. Okay. I, I intend, like if you, if, you, if you put in, like not thousands of hours of work, but some regular work for the next, you know, period, the next, you know, third of the class and sort of until it gets comfortable. You won't have to invest a huge amount of time, but if you do it regularly and you try to do it on your own without referencing to the thing, I do not think you will have any trouble. In the past, people have not had any trouble. But at this stage, it is absolutely normal that it feels totally incomprehensible. So if that's you, it's OK. You know, it, it can't stay that way, obviously. But at this stage, it, it's not unexpected. What are you meant to do? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, I've prepared for today. I prepared a summary of what we've done so far because I know forest for the trees, right? So I'm going to go over the summary, and 
then we'll talk about the kind of questions I can ask. Okay. Yeah. And I haven't written the questions, so I don't know the kind of questions that I can ask, but I can speculate about the kind of, kind of questions I might ask. Okay. So the first thing is why? Why? Why the hell did we do this Fisher Gray stuff? Like what? Why? It's not a nice way to treat a person, making them learn this stuff. Um, it's all well and good to say it will get better, but why treat me bad in the first place? What the hell? Um, there's a couple of reasons why we, we did this. First of all, we're dealing with expectations. Expectations are central to everything in macroeconomics. Right? It's Keynes's animal spirits. It's how people do investments looking towards the future. It's setting your wages, setting your contracts all of this stuff, and even just do people stop spending, right? We know that there's this multiplier effect of so people stop spending because they're worried about the future, then output will go down, causing a recession. So all of this is super important. We need to know where they come from, right? Like it is a central need, and this is kind of the way we do it for, for reasons I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, the other thing is math shows up everywhere in economics, so Second year, it's time for us to introduce you to it. So I pick one with math. Um, and I picked this one in particular, first of all, because it's lovely. And because, I know you don't think so, but it is. It's gorgeous. It's, it's a thing of beauty. Honest, it is. Um, but I picked this one in particular not because you're going to think it's a thing of beauty yet. Maybe later, maybe later. Um, but because it teaches us things that we could not learn without it. Right? If we were just doing the graphical stuff that we did in first year, we would not be able to learn this stuff. It's, you know, we don't know anyway, right? And so I know you don't feel like you learned anything at the moment, but, but, but you did. Um, but we wouldn't be able to get at it in the same way. So it's, it's something, you, know, we, you need to know the math. You need to, to, you know, to be introduced to how ec econo economists think about things these days, which is mathematically. You need to, to understand expectations. Otherwise, you don't understand macro at all. Right, is macro is expectations by and large. And look, we want to see like why are we doing this kind of thing? Well, because you can learn things that you can't learn in other ways, and this model gets us to that. Yeah, I know we're dizzy from all the, the, the equations and all, but but th this is where we're at. So that's why this particular model. Um, so we saw like in the Phillips curve model that that people's expectations of prices and inflation are important, right? Because you're setting these contracts and the contract's gonna be in a place for a while, either explicit contract or just, you know, the custom is that you don't negotiate your wage every day. Maybe once a year you go and ask your boss for a raise, but it's not an everyday thing. And so you have to figure out what's gonna happen over the next year while you're gonna be in that wage. And they have to figure out the same thing. So expectations of the future are very important. And then we have this, this fundamental problem that people clearly care about prices. They have to predict prices. And if we think we have policies, like monetary policies, fiscal policies, that might affect prices themselves, and certainly things like you know, taxes do, and money, money supply presumably can. And so we have things that can affect prices, which means if I'm trying to predict prices, I have to predict policy, right? Because otherwise I can't know all the stuff that's going on in prices. I need to predict prices for my wages, and to do that I need to predict policy. And this is our fundamental problem. And why this whole rational expectations thing comes in is that we really have to, to think about how do we think about policy, in this case monetary policy, but any policy, in a world where people are trying to predict what we're doing. And they're gonna change their behavior based on what they think we're going to do, right? Okay. Um, and we also have a situation where in real life, and so we built it into the model, but in real life where things change, right? So it's not like you can sit down and just predict policy, but you have to figure out, you know, like they could say we're gonna increase the money supply, good for them, and, and suppose we believe them, but then conditions change over time. And though for no fault of their own, maybe increasing money supply isn't such a good idea anymore. And so they don't do it. And it's not like they were lying to us. It's just that conditions are changing. And so we have to not only figure out what these guys are doing, we have to figure out how they will react to a changing environment. 
So if the environment changes, in our case velocity shocks, but any other change in the environment, the world changes, you get your COVID, you get your stock market crashes, the usual stuff, and then they're going to change the policy. And we have to predict how they're going to change the policy when these shocks happen. Right? And this is a problem. Like, like we, we could have in our Phillips curve model, we could have the indifference curve and we could say, when nothing's changing, when there's no shocks and everything's stable, we could figure out what the long run equilibrium looked like. And so we didn't need all of this rigmarole to just say, well, what do we expect prices, inflation to be? Say, well, we're going to be in equilibrium. The, tang the indifference curve is going to be tangent to the Phillips curve, and that's going to give us this inflation bias. We could say that, but we couldn't say that in any kind of an environment where things were uncertain. Right? The only uncertainty was trying to guess what the central bank was doing. There was no uncertainty about the world. And if we tried to put in uncertainty about the world, we didn't really have any way to do that in a graphical model. And even if we sort of did some kind of ad hoc thing, we wouldn't be certain that we were doing it right because it would be very ad hoc. It's just not there in the graph, uncertainty. right? And so you'd have to sort of impose it on top and hope that you reasoned through it correctly. Okay. So we need to, to, to figure out how to do this. And the way we do that is we, we do it through math, right? Because then one of our big restrictions we have on, on when we do things graphically is we can only have two dimensions, right? Because it's two-dimensional graph paper. It's the, the nature of, of paper. It's a two-dimensional sheet of paper, right? Um, and so we can only graph something against something else. And that's why we get all these shifting curves in all the graphs, right? If something else changes that's not in the graph, it has to shift the curve. And that's fine as far as it goes, as long as these are simple changes. But when we start talking about more than two variables, it becomes really kind of problematic. And here, even if we have a simple model where we're not thinking about too many variables, we're really wondering how things happen across time. We set our wages. And then the shock happens, and we set output. And we're all the time trying to predict what the central bank is going to do. So we got like prices now, we got prices in the future, we got output now, we got output in the future, we got wages, we got central bank behavior. Right? We got a lot of stuff that in order to tell any kind of interesting story, we're kind of forced to deal with. Like we, we tried to put down a simple model. I tried to make it as close as possible to the Phillips curve model. But even then, there's a ton of moving parts, right? There's our expectations yesterday of tomorrow, and, right? There's all that rigmarole. And the graph by nature is two dimensional, and we just can't handle it. But math by nature is as many things as you want to throw in it, right? And so if we move over to a mathematical representation rather than a graphical, expect, um, graphical representation, we can put in all the bits that we, we think are important, not just the bits that fit on our two-dimensional graph. Right? Now, we lose something in the process. It's not like we, we get everything for free. Right? It becomes, as you may have noticed, less understandable. Right? The graph was clear, and then oh, what the hell? Um, this is a problem. It's, it's not trivial, right? We do the graphs and we continue to do the graphs, not because they're the most precise representation, but they're a way to get our little brains around the problem. Right? The brains are small and so we have to, to simplify things to tell the story, but it can't be our only way, right? We need to, to also be more precise with more variables. So we need the precision, we need the ability to put in lots of variables, but we also need the way to tell the story in a simple way. Right? And so both the graphs and the math, they, they work together. We don't like abandoned graphs just because we, we added the math, but we do need to add the math. Right? So otherwise, we can't analyze these sorts of problems. Okay. And then, of course, we can trick it up. We can do things. We have one period contracts. We can do the two period contracts. We can say, what happens if shocks are persistent? And you can imagine, even if I you know, clutched together something with the graph where we could do uncertainty in some way, I'd be really restricted in the ways I could do it. Like putting in these two period contracts, it's just not going to be possible like in any kind of precise way. Like I could like tell a story, but it would be really goofy, and I'd be really pushing things, right? Which I do. I'm, I'm a goofball, and I push things. But 
it wouldn't be super convincing, right? Okay, maybe I buy his story, but you know, he's nuts, so. Um, but when you, when you have the math, you can say, okay, this, these are the assumptions very clearly. You can buy them or not, but you know what they are. And then you can see where the logical conclusion is. Okay? And that is why we subjected you to all this misery. Okay? So it forces us to be very precise in our assumptions. We know exactly what we're assuming, what we're not assuming. And it forces us to think very logically about the problem and allows us to analyze problems that we really couldn't if we were just doing graphs. Okay. And this, of course, is one such problem that where we can learn things that we would not have been able to, to learn with the graphs. Okay. So let me talk a bit about, because you guys have an exam coming up, and this is getting at your question a little bit, what, what kind of thing can, can I ask you? Um, we have a bunch of major assumptions, you know, some, some major assumptions that went into the model, and you should know what they are and why they were made. Okay? You don't have to do the algebra for them at this stage, but you should be able to say, yeah, this is what we assumed in this model. This is what was driving the model. Here's why we assumed it, and here's what it gets us. Right? So if I put down one of the equations, you should be able to tell me what, what it's on about and why that was part of the, the thing. So we had our, our first thing was a production function. We said output depended on labor. And we had diminishing marginal returns to labor. So the first guy that you hired gave you lots of output. The second guy gave you less. Third guy gave you less and so on. And that's important because we're, we're talking about right, how many people get employed. We need to say what output is. And we need a mechanism by where the hell did output come from. And our story is people worked to make the stuff. It's not a deep story, but it is, I think, a reasonable story. The stuff doesn't appear. Somebody worked to make the story. The more people that make the stuff and the more people we put in, the less productive each additional guy is. Everybody produces more, but they become less and less productive because we have a limited amount of capital. Right? There's a limited amount of sh machines. We're digging a pit. We only have 10 shovels. We can put 10 guys on the job, but the 11th guy isn't as productive because he doesn't have a shovel. But he does take over when the other guy gets tired, so he still is useful, right? and so on and so forth. Right? We have a limited amount of machines, capital to work with, and we put more and more people, they become less and less productive. Okay? And that gives us a connection between employment and output. And, and employment is something that firms are deciding on, and that's going to affect output, and that's what we're, we're interested in. So it's the sort of very simplest way that we can have like a real story about where output comes from. Remember, we had that Keynesian model way back in the midst of time where, where people just sort of said, I want a haircut, and it got cut right at the spot, and there was no real idea of where the heck that came from. And that gave us goofy results. It gave us, if we want output to go up, just increase government spending. And if we want output to go up again, increase government spending. And if we want output to go up again, just increase government spending. And we could just spend our way to riches. It was ridiculous and silly. It captured something real. But clearly, it was leaving loads and loads out. Right? Here, because we have this, we're not going to be able to get that kind of thing. Right? In order to get more output, we need to get more people working. And that is going to be less and less productive. Right? So there's, there's it's tied to reality more. I know it's a very simple equation, but it's you know, the, very, the simplest production function we could have, really. But it, it ties things down in a way we didn't have before. OK. All right. The other thing is that once the wage is set, now the wage is set somehow, and prices are determined somehow, outside of firm's control, right? wages and prices are set, at least now. They were set last, last period or in contracts or whatever. Once they're set, we're going to have competitive labor markets. So that is, each firm doesn't think that it can control the wage. Each firm is just going to hire workers as long as they're profitable. So if a worker is producing more than I'm paying him in real terms, I'm going to hire him. And so I'm going to keep hiring workers until the marginal product of labor goes down to, to the real wage. Okay? Just profit maximization. And this tells us how much labor is going to happen in the economy, and it's going to tell us how much output happens in the economy through that production function in the last step. Right? So what, what's going to happen here is that the real wage, however it's determined, the real wage is going to determine how much output we have in the economy. Right? If the real wage is low, they're going to hire loads of workers. We're going to get loads of output. 
If the real wage is high, they're not going to hire very many workers. We're going to get very little output. And that's just, yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's a competitive labor market. Right? Each firm is small. They don't think they can control these things. They just sort of hire workers. And each worker is identical, right? because you're just hiring generic workers until they become not productive. And they're not becoming less productive because they're bad workers. They're becoming less productive because you only have so many shovels to help them dig the hole. Right? So you have limited capital, and that's why they become less productive. Okay. Okay. And wages. Wages are on some kind of short-term contract. So you're going to set your wage, and you're going to be stuck with it. And we have these periods, so you're going to set it one period, and you're going to be stuck with it the next period. Okay. And importantly, and this is sort of the crucial thing that drives everything, you don't know everything you need to know about what prices are going to be. There's going to be some randomness in the economy, so you're going to have to predict tomorrow's prices when you're setting your wages. And sometimes you're going to get, get it wrong. Sometimes your, your real wage is going to be high, sometimes it's going to be low. You're going to set your wage based on your prediction, but if prices are higher than you predicted, then your real wage will be low. They're going to hire lots of people like you, but you're going to be working for peanuts. Right? Or sometimes the prices will be, be really low, and your real wage will be enormous. And they won't hire very many guys, but if you've got a job, you're getting rich. Right? Just depending on how the prices turn out. We're going to make mistakes about pr predicting prices, and the real wage is going to determine output. Okay? So our wage is determined based on what we predict prices are going to be. Okay. And we got the quantity theory of money, right? I don't, I don't have a pen to write this with somewhere. But you know, m is equal, what? Money times prices is equal to velocity times, no, money times velocity is equal to prices times output. Right? That is, how much each euro is spent, right? How many euros do we have times how many times does each euro get spent each year? That's the total amount of money that got spent. Right? If we have 100 euros and each one gets spent five times in a year, 500 euros got spent. That has to be equal to the value of stuff bought. The amount of stuff that was bought times the price that the stuff was. Right? Now that's not really a theory, but it's called the quantity theory because way back in the 60s, Milton Friedman attached a lot of other baggage to it, so it got, got a theory name, but it, it's just the definition of velocity. So we have that, and that's determining our money market. Right? So our goods market was all this production function stuff and the wages. Our money market is just this quantity theory of money. So there's, there's nothing, nothing controversial about that. It, it's a thing. It's true. There's issues about how you define money. Are we talking M1? Are we talking M2? How do you define the price level? Is it the CPI? Is it the producer price? Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that, details. But as a general thing, it's fine right? at this level of detail. OK. And then we need randomness. right? We need randomness in our model because it's all about predicting stuff. And if we want to have any kind of realistic thing about predicting stuff, we have to follow Yogi, Yogi Berra's maxim that predicting is difficult, especially about the future. And so we've got to make it difficult. You can't, like, in our, in our original model, in the Phillips curve model, it was fine. People were trying to predict stuff, but there was no randomness. And so there was no reason you'd ever screw up. But I don't know about you and how your life is, but my life, I screw up all the time in guessing what the future is and other things as well. Um, we are human. We make mistakes. And particularly when we don't have all the information yet, we make mistakes all the time. Like it, It's kind of built in, right? Um, right? Is the Borderlands movie going to be good? I don't know. The trailer looks good. right? We don't know. It's a, it's a random event that's coming up. Um, and that's going to affect the economy, I'm telling you. Um, OK. So we need to add randomness somewhere. And we put it in velocity just because that's a loose term. Right? It, it's an easy place to put it. Um, all the same conclusions would come if we put it anywhere. Right? For what we need is some kind of randomness, some kind of thing that's difficult to predict, that you can predict only imperfectly. So we need, need like, I don't know what the future holds. So we need some randomness in there. And we could put it anywhere. We just did it as simply as we could by sticking it on velocity. But if we wanted to be more realistic, we would think, like, what is really random in real life? And maybe that 
that, you know, the coefficients of the production function are, are random in real life. Maybe oil prices are random in real life and that affects something. We could do that, all the conclusions would be the same, but the math would be worse, even worse, I know. So we, we did it as simply as possible. We stuck it in velocity. velocity. Probably not the most realistic way to do it, but somewhere to put it that, that's relatively easy. And those are our major assumptions. Um, I don't, didn't get the one where, where we're targeting a particular real wage. We said, we, you know, we're not going to get into what wage negotiations look like. So we're going to say everybody predicts the future prices and they set their wage so that they're going to get some real wage that's exogenous just given like. You know, if workers have a lot of negotiating power, is it going to be a high real wage? If firms have a lot of negotiating pay, power, it's going to be a low real wage. But there's some target real wage, and that is just to make our, our labor market as simple as we can. Right? It's, it's not because we believe that's true, but just because our story isn't really about how wages are set, other than you need to predict the future in order to do it. Right? So that simplifies that. We keep the predict the future bit. That's the, the crucial bit of our story, and the rest we just do as simply as possible. Okay. In this pass, we wanted to make it more realistic. Of course, people, we can and people have made this way more realistic, but the, the conclusions are, are the same, right? other than details of things if you were like empirically oriented. All right. Questions about the major assumptions? So like, what could I ask you? I could ask you questions about any of these. Right? Like, do you understand how wages are set in this model? Do you understand why people are, need to predict the future? If I give you one of the equations, I don't expect you to remember them, but if I give you one of the equations, can you tell me what it's on about and why it's there? Now, obviously, it's going to be in a multiple choice format. So right? I could have like, you know, the real wage is equal to the marginal product of labor. And you should know that that's coming from profit maximization, hiring workers up to the point where, right? So that kind of thing. I don't think I, in, I intend to ask any trick questions about this, but I do intend. Did you understand why we're making the assumptions? Do you understand basically what they mean? Okay. No, wrong computer. OK. Now, I to told you, I promised you, that we learned things that we couldn't otherwise learn. So let me, just so that you, you have an idea why you're learning all this, just to, to sort of say, like, what did we learn? You know, you got the forest for the trees, all these, this algebra came at you. You don't know what's going on. So let me just sort of remind you what we learned. Okay. We talked about rational expectations versus adaptive expectations as sort of two ways to think about things, about how people form expectations, and sort of two ways to think about this as scientists trying to understand the world. Right. And one of the troubles with adaptive expectations is, in some cases, it fits what people seem to be doing reasonably well. But we can just, what we're doing there is we're saying, here's how people, what people assume the future looks like. Okay? And we might be right, but we might be wrong, and we don't really have any way to constrain ourselves to just pick the right one, other than you know, trying to do a good job. Um, we don't know whether we're picking the right one or not. Um, and when we do that, we can get whatever we answer we want by picking, you know, everyone thinks this about the future. Everyone thinks that about the future. And that's like, that seems a little fishy way to be doing science, right? It's, maybe it's true, but you can get whatever you want. You just assumed it. I don't know. Um, now, there's always a bit of that in theory anyway. But, but it's, it's a little suspect. It's not necessarily wrong, but it's a little suspect. The other really big problem with adaptive expectations is that the results are coming about because people are being systematically fooled. Right? They're, you're saying you're expecting that, but the model says other things are supposed to happen. Right? So the world they live in is the world of this model. And we're saying they should expect this about the future, but the model says this other thing's going to happen. Which means that they are systematically thinking the wrong thing about the future. Now, in our model, we got randomness, right? So the people are going to get it wrong. 
but they're not going to get it systematically wrong. Sometimes they're going to be guessing too high, sometimes they're going to be guessing too low. They're not going to be tricked the same way year in, year out, year in, year out. But adapt adaptive expectations, they really can be tricked in exactly the same way every single year forever. Right? And that's maybe true. Like you've met people. People are, are, are what they are. But it, again, it seems suspicious, particularly you know, in our daily life, lots of things like you know, we, we keep guessing the, the future wrong, but it's not important to us. But in the things that are really important, like our livelihood and stuff, people think a little more clearly. So it's, it seems to a lot of us, you can have your own opinion, obviously, but things are a little, like when, when it's really important, when big money is involved, when it's major life choices, people try to understand the world, world they live in. They make an honest attempt at it anyway. And adaptive expectations just doesn't have that. Yet. But there's no, this is how the world works, and therefore I expect this. It's just, this is what I expect which is problematic, right? Yeah? So I, I believe uh, rational means that you have to thoroughly calculate and think. Yeah. And where adaptive is simply you get used to the new environment. And yeah. I'm wondering that, are those two kind of like similar? They can be. Like, it's jargon. Like, it's terms of art. They, they mean this because historically they meant this. OK. okay. But you know, if, you, if you're just going in with English, what does rational mean? In this context, rational expectations means our expectations are based on all the information in the model. Okay, so they know how the model works. They know how the world they live in works. And adaptive expectations is it's just backward looking. What happened in the past? Okay, but yeah, like in terms of English, you're absolutely right. It's, but, but it's jargon. Okay. Just like when we say profit, we don't mean what profit means in English, right? It's, or when we say potential output, we don't mean the best output you can get. It's just the it's goofy terms that have developed over the last century that we're, we're kind of stuck with. So the problem with adaptive expectations is not that you're trying to fool people. It's that you can't keep the fool. With adaptive expectations, it implies that they're going to get fooled over and over and over again. Right. Yeah. So. No. Now, in real life, people are fooled all the time, right? It's not like it's a... It's a big news that people get it wrong. But the systematic way that they're getting fooled is problematic, right? Now, there's lots of psychology literature that, that says that people do get fooled in systematic ways, right? Like our brains are not perfectly calculating machines like we sort of imply here. Right? We, we're, we're imperfect about our calculations, and we have certain biases about probabilities. and right? And um, the answer to that, though, is not to say, uh, we'll just make up whatever we think that you ought to expect. The answer to that is to say, well, in what ways are our brains biased? In what ways do we get probabilities wrong? How do our brains actually work? And let's put that into the model. Right? And then we can have rational expectations based on that notion of rationality. Giving, we're doing the best we can given the limitations or the behavior of our brain. Like we're still trying to understand the world we, we live in, but maybe we're not good at that understanding in some kind of systematic way. Right? So all that's true, and that's a whole branch of literature, behavioral economics, that, look, that looks at psychology literature and says, OK, in what ways do people behave weird? And there are many. There are many, many ways that people behave not like this model would suggest. Like we have probability in particular we have a hard time with. We, we rate losses differently than we rate gains. We have, you know, it depends on where you are, what you've gotten used to. If you have this kind of lifestyle, you behave one way. If you have that kind of lifestyle, you behave in it. Like, there's all kinds of these things. And that's not even getting into sexism and racism and all kinds of goofy things that we got going on in our brains. Um, so we, we do want it to deal with that. It's not like we don't. This model doesn't, all of that stuff. But the way to deal with it is not to say, Ah, we'll just make up whatever people expect. The way to deal with it is say, OK, how does that work? How do people's brains actually work? And let's put that, say, in the utility function or into, into the model in a, in a way, way so that when people are trying to predict the future, they're using the limitations of their brain. And they're also realizing that other people might have limitations to their brain, and they're using all the information of the model 
and the policy. Right? Because just because our brains behave weird, which they do, doesn't mean that we aren't trying to predict what the money supply is going to be right? in an active way. We might be bad at it, but we're certainly trying. Right? Not us personally, but you know, corporations and insurance companies and these guys. Definitely. So the thing we're trying to solve with rational expectations is leaving out that people are trying to understand the world that they're in and the policy environment that they're in. Okay. Now we're doing it in a very simple way because we're starting out with the simplest model, but that's the idea. And yeah, we definitely have, you know, this is not the way, the way we, we sort of introduce rational consumers is not the way actual humans behave, but we can add that in once we have sort of the infrastructure to do that. Now that's like a whole ongoing area of research. And it's something that actually UCD is, is kind of good at, the behavioral economics stuff. Um, but it's not obviously our topic here. Okay. But yeah, it's a cool, it's all a really cool subject. But again, not, not, not here, not me. Okay. okay. So we talked about that. And, and the fact that we have rational expectations just to, to sort of go back to the earlier point, the fact that we're interested in looking at people trying to understand the policy environment that they're in, trying to understand that the world they're in, means that we have more need to do things mathematically, right? Because we have to really know what is this, this environment that they're in, what does it imply? If we were just going to say, here's their expectations, we wouldn't need the math as much because we just said we gave them their expectations. But we really want their expectations to be consistent with the model. Right, so that they're not systematically fooled. And the nice thing about rational expectations, they will be fooled, but they won't be fooled in a systematic way. It'll be random shocks that make them, make them fooled, but, but it won't be, I'm always guessing too low. I wonder why that is. Well, guess higher, right? It won't be that. Okay. That's that bit. Okay, so what did we learn? With rational expectations, monetary policy cannot affect output if the central bank has the same information as wage setters. That's what we learned so far. That turns out not to be entirely true. And after, after our break, we are going to come back and we're going to use the model to add one more reason. But for now, this is what we know. Okay? One more reason that policy can affect, like, that we would not have known otherwise. But, so I, I put that in as a caveat so that you're aware that it's not a complete statement yet. But as of, of now, what we've learned is that if you have the same information as wage setters, you can't affect output, right? Because output is coming from people predicting prices wrong when they're setting their wages. And if they know what you know, if they know what the central bank knows, then they can predict what the central bank is going to do. And so they're going to use that prediction in setting their price predictions. And so there's nothing the central bank can do to affect output because it doesn't have any superior information and people are able to predict its behavior because they have all the information that the central bank has. Okay. And this, by the way, is very different from what we had last year. I think, okay, that's the thing, let's write it down. But no, it's like very, very different, right? Because before, like we had money supply and money demand and you shifted out money supply and you moved down the curve and then interest rates fell and then investment went up and it was like very mechanistic, right? But now, if you say, yay, let's increase the money supply. We'll move down the money demand curve. Interest rates will fall and investment will go up. It'll be glorious. But people will say, you know, I bet he's going to increase the money supply and we're going to move down the, the money demand curve and the interest rates will fall and the investment will go up. So I better take that into account when I'm doing my thing. Right? And so because people are trying to, actively trying to predict what the central bank is up to, the central bank can't get away with a lot of the crap that they could last year. Right, because we're on top of them, we know what they're doing. What that's going to do is going to mean my real wage is too low because they increase the price level and I'm going to be working for peanuts. I'm not doing that, I want higher wages. Right? And so because they're actively predicting us, some of the things that we thought they could do last year, not true. Okay? That's what we get. Yeah? Yeah, and that's because they had better information. But some of the wage setters in that model were using information from two periods ago, but we were using information from one period ago. So the central bank was using information that those wage setters didn't have. Yeah. 
And so that's the next bit. You can affect output if the central bank has better information or is able to react more quickly than wage setters. Okay? From this point of view, it doesn't really matter. Like it could be that those wage setters at time period t minus two, they obviously didn't know what the future held. And then period time t, came, t minus one comes along and there's a big shock. And they know that and the central bank knows it, but they can't do anything because they're locked into these contracts. Right? So even if they know it, it doesn't matter. There's nothing they can do about it. And then the central bank can affect output because they're reacting to something that people didn't know when they set their wages. Okay? It's these contracts that get them into trouble. Right? It's the contract that gives us these output fluctuations because they lock themselves into a real wage and then conditions change and that means the real wage is different from what they expected. And so more people or less people get hired. And now when we have monetary policy, if we can react quickly to that before they change their wage, we can smooth out those prices, right? If prices were going way up, we can bring them down by decreasing the money supply. If prices were going way down, we can bring them up by increasing the money supply. And we can smooth those out because we have information and can react to it that they either don't have or can't react to. And that gives policy a way to work, even though we have rational expectations. So rational expectations is making it more difficult for policy to be effective because we're trying to do something and they're trying to predict us and they're building that, their prediction of our behavior into their, their choices. But if we have better or more recent information or re more able to react more quickly than they are, then we can affect output. Okay? And again, that's something that we couldn't know without the math. Okay? We could speculate, but we couldn't know. We wouldn't know what assumptions are required for that. And then at the end of this, which I haven't posted yet, but I'll post tonight, I've made a glossary of terms so that when you're looking through all that horrific stuff that you have some idea of, you know, because it's hard to remember, I know, all the different things and how to pronounce your Greek letters. Um, I looked it up. I don't know how to pronounce my Greek letters. Wiggle, squiggle, all these things. So when you see a thing that you know what it is. And you should, if I write the equation, you should know what the thing is. So it's nice to have a glossary. Um, I'm also going through the notes. I have, have not finished, but I'm going through the notes and putting little additions. Like this bit is just mathematical manipulation. This bit's a new idea it's to help you along as you, as you go through. You are responsible for the new ideas. You are not responsible for the manipulation or the solving yet, but you will be but not for this exam. All right, that's what I got for you today. Um, I can answer questions if you've got them. Am I correct that whenever you talk of output, you mean physical quantity of goods, not output as measured by the money term? Right, it's, it's real GDP. So I, I should actually change that. I'll put real GDP. It's real GDP. Because we have, in our quantity theory, we have price times output, so that's the total money spent on stuff. So it has to be real GDP. Yeah, yeah, but, it's, yeah. but it's goods and services as well. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So if it's real GDP, mm -hmm. Steph, I remember at the beginning of the lecture, you mm -hmm. said that output is, uh, output is like labor. Output, um, I wish I brought a pen. Um, output comes from labor. So we have a production function. You put in labor and out comes stuff, goods and services. Right, so the more labor you put in, the more stuff. So you can really go back and forth between the two because it's a simple model. There's no capital fluctuations, but there could be. But, but in the version we have, more labor means more stuff. But in a nonlinear way, like you add a little labor at first, you get a lot more stuff. Then you add a little more labor, you get less stuff. Right, you always get more, but at a decreasing rate. Okay, uh, looks like people are clearing up. So I will too. <laughs>